everybody. Um, so you want to talk about war? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of on our minds these days, isn't it? Um, anyway, all right, so I'm Kate Fold. I'm director of Hollywood Health and Society. We got to get a new logo. USC just takes up the, you know, it's like our tiny little font up there, but at any rate, USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center Hollywood Health and Society program. And we've been, we were founded 20 years ago, actually more like 22 years ago now, um, by Norman Lear and Marty Kaplan um, to be a free resource to the entertainment industry on all aspects of health, medicine, science, safety, and security. So pretty much everything. We're partnered with the Writers Guild and with the Producers Guild and the Television Academy. So we're a support system for writers like the, those who you're gonna meet in just a few minutes. Um, just to offer them information, research, and access to experts on all those topics and beyond. So they can do what they do best, which is tell amazing stories. So uh, if you know us, or if you're a writer looking for some help with research, you can find us at hollywoodhealthandsociety.org. It's just all one word smushed together. But anyway, enough about me. Uh, let's talk about our... Our panel, where am I supposed to sit? I'm gonna sit here. So, extra. So we have a fascinating panel today to talk about a fabulous show and also just the topic in general. First up, Sam Shaw, creator, executive producer of Castle Rock and Manhattan and a bunch of other stuff. Come on up, Sam. <laughs> And Lee LaBayak, writer-producer for Castle Rock, The Leftovers, Watchmen, and Manhattan, among others. And Tommy Schlamme, executive producer, director of The West Wing, The Americans, When We Rise, Manhattan. I could, I could go on and on with everybody's illustrious credits, but at least that gets us started, and you guys can talk about uh, other shows if it's relevant. Um, so the title of our panel is War and Peace. Note, it's not the title of the panel, this is the title of my page, Notes for War and Peace panel. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, we want to talk about War and Peace and kind of how it's dealt with on TV and using Manhattan as the example, which was a fantastic show, and I just re-watched all two seasons, and... Oh, wow. Yes, oh my gosh, and I, I have, I'm angry that we had to end where we ended, which is a question I want to get to with you, Sam, in a minute, about what your vision was for Beyond, because we all... You, you want to see me cry on a panel. Uh, yes, uh -huh. <laughs> but, but let's start with, was this an issue that you always wanted to write about? Uh... Th uh, thanks, by the way, for doing this. Thank you guys for, for coming to talk about nuclear weapons on a Saturday or whatever we're talking about. It's great to see you all. Um, uh, no, no. And in fact, um, Manhattan had a very weird genesis um, that I, I would say, like, I do not um, recommend this process to any other writer. But it began um, as a feature, not a TV show, um, about another war on another continent in another century. Um, I sort of started out um, trying to write something about the war on terror in probably like 2004 or five. And there was a, um, to make a long story short, my, my dad had been a um, criminal defense attorney. He retired, but um, he doesn't golf. And so he took on a bunch of pro bono clients to sort of keep um, from completely losing his mind. And those included a couple of uh, uh, Yemeni uh, detainees at Guantanamo, um, which was this, um, it became this sort of extraordinary coda to his professional life. And I had a million questions for him, just as a, um, you know, a, a writer and therefore a vulture who wanted to steal and, um, and write about his experiences. But the, the really, the sort of fascinating piece to me was that because he was dealing with issues of national security, um, he couldn't talk about essentially any of the details of that work um, with me or with my sister or with his friends. Um, he, he, you know, to, to see his own 
notes after his uh, interviews with his clients, he'd have to like take the train to Washington DC and ride an elevator up to some like hermetically sealed office in some windowless building. Um, and so that, that was really interesting to me. It was sort of um, interesting to think about what the costs of secrecy are um, when you're involved with work that isolates you from the people in your life who are both supposed to be your kind of moral ballast and you know emotional resource, but also sort of um, to help you to have a sort of context and sense of right and wrong, especially when you're dealing with really morally complicated issues. So, um, so that's what I tried to write, and I failed really miserably. And part of it was that you know it was just. Uh, that was history that was still unfolding, and it was really hard for me to have any sense of kind of moral ob objectivity around it. Um, but in researching that project, what I sort of discovered was that like all roads, when you're dealing with issues of um, of national security and um, the kind of military industrial secrecy uh, machine and trade-offs between freedom and security, all that stuff, they all seem to lead back to um, New Mexico in the 1940s. And so it was sort of through the process of um, reading first one book and then another and another that I sort of talked myself out of one project and into another. And then, um, and then there was a long process of writing and rewriting and rewriting it uh, that landed me in Tommy Shlamy's office, finally. Yeah, well, um, you touched on something that I want to get to in a minute, but let's stick with just putting the show together. And, um, you know, I watched it when it first came out, but I rewatched it again recently to just remember. And, um, you know, I still learned things. I, I learned things and then I thought, wait, because some, some characters are fictional and some are based on, you know, we've got Oppenheimer in there and, we, you know, so, so then I would think, well, wait, is this, did this really happen or is this part of the world? So I, I wonder if you can talk, or Leela, maybe you, do, you too, and Tommy about, um, you know, how, why did you choose that? Like, Frank Winter wasn't a real character, but he was based on someone who was kind of a real character, right? And, and there are others, of course. So I'd love anybody who wants to weigh in on kind of how you made those choices. Sam? Well, I was, <laughs> um, that, that was sort of like the first giant choice that sort of like um, dictated almost everything else. And, and part of what, what it was was that like, um, I was really interested in what the human relationships were in this place. It was such a bizarro moment in history. Like I, I knew a little bit about the Manhattan Project, but it, um, it's, it's way more of a, Twilight Zone episode, then, you know, and it's sort of one of those cases where, like, the more you learn about it, the less comprehensible it is. Like, initially, they thought 300 scientists would be able to crack the bomb, and then, which was, for guys who were, and women who were generally pretty good at math, that was, like, a really spectacularly bad calculation, because it wound up, you know, involving hundreds of thousands of people all over the country, but... They built this town overnight, and you know it was a town. It was a you know there were grocery stores, and there were teachers, and you know the vast majority of the six thousand people who were living there had no idea what the purpose of the town was until they turned on their radios and learned that this city in Japan had ceased to exist, and now and they had to sort of reckon with the question of what they'd been party to. Um, but so that was the stuff that seemed most interesting to me. Is you know um, obviously there were huge geopolitical stakes to the storytelling, but it was really interesting to me that um, these weren't, they weren't going to be stories about generals, you know, redrawing maps or, you know, um, deploying troops. They were, it was a moment where the sort of fate of the world was being um, adjudicated, like, around kitchen tables in this weirdo, you know, pop-up city in the middle of the desert. And so, because I knew that we wanted to be able to write about um, marriages and relationships between parents and kids, and you know, especially now that we have kids of our own in a world that feels really precarious, interesting to think about these human beings who were sort of like on the front line. They were the first 
human beings who understood that they were living in a world in which humankind was going to have the capacity to destroy itself. And, and what would it be to tuck your kids in at night and feel that? And so um, that's a really long answer to basically to say that it felt like we would, to be able to have the kind of license to tell the stories we wanted to be able to tell. Um, we did a ton of research and a, and a huge amount of the life experience of a lot of real scientists and other folks who were there at Los Alamos got metabolized into the fictional characters we created. But basically it sort of felt like there would be Oppenheimer and every once in a while, I guess, General Stimson comes in at some point, but you know they would be sort of like these Olympian gods, and then otherwise we would be populating our world with a kind of um, you know bizarro set of of scientists and military personnel. And that went with the creation of the show too. The visual creation of the show was the same sort of thing, and and using you know the the uh, blueprint that Sam and the writers already had come up with to sort of take the liberty that know that we're fictionalizing something that's very real. Um, so that it wasn't about we had to absolutely construct exactly what Los Alamos looked like, but if we could construct the emotional truth of what Los Alamos was, which was this prisoner of war camp and this you know uh, world of transition and this idea that you could leave and that you know uh, no one knew about it. I mean that first and foremost was for me the most difficult conceptual idea that didn't somebody drive by? Didn't somebody go, what's in there? What's, and it wasn't. I mean, the vice president of the United States did not know about it. So that's how secret it is. Well, and also, I mean, uh, so for those of you who don't know, Sam and I are married and we've been, we were, we were married before the show, uh, from the earliest days that Sam started working on and, the show. And we remain married and after we remain the show. Married after. Is, um, but I remember very early on when, when you first started talking about, about what, was interesting about this subject matter to you and why you wanted to write a show about it. From the very earliest days, you were interested in the stories of the women who were there, who were mostly excluded from, um, the, from the secret experiments that were going on. And, um, and the fact is that, by and large, those stories um, have been lost to history. Um, they were not recorded in the same way that the stories of the male scientists um, and, and military personnel were to the extent that they were. And so to some extent there was, an, by necessity, you know, we had to fictionalize those stories because we had to imagine our way inside of the lives of the people who were there whose histories were not written. Um, so that was really fundamental to the to the project of the series um, from the beginning. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And and I was thinking about it as I was watching again. You know, it, it's a show about secrets. It's a show about all kinds of secrets that people keep from each other and from the government, and the government keeps from them. And and it's about the consequences that those secrets can have. And especially, I mean, there's a there's a line that Kitty says about uh, when she's talking to, um, Abby. to Abby, Abby, thank you, Abby's, uh, the, Charlie Isaac's wife, and she says, men say they want a woman who understands them, but when they get one, they discover what, it, what a burden it is to be known. And I, 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 I'm getting goosebumps, mm -hmm. I mean, it was just such a, profound line, um, and I'll tell you, that, so Hollywood Health and Society, we have been working on the issue of nuclear weapons and the depiction of nuclear weapons for about six or seven years now, and when it first, when we first began this, this was prior to Trump being elected, there had been a study done with young people about the existential threats that they worried about that kept them up at night, and it was climate change, it was health insurance, it was paying off my student loan, it was these things. Nuclear weapons, nuclear war was nowhere on their radar, no pun intended. Um, and this is a problem because nuclear weapons are still a big deal. But young people thought, ah, they're relegated to World War II, it's not a thing anymore. And um, so that was a problem. So um, we've worked with these nuclear scientists and nuclear experts and people that are advocates and in policy. And they have to keep a lot of secrets. 
Like a lot of the work they do, they can't just talk about it. And it takes a toll on their mental health. And of course, we see that in the show, not only with the, the scientists, but with the wives and you know, everybody else. And, um, and the fact that you know, there's all kinds of secrets. There's big ones that can blow up the world and there's small ones like Oppenheimer's having an affair. Did he really have an affair or did you put that in there? For I don't know, he did, he, he did. did. And she, and she <laughs> was, I mean, she was murdered, right? I mean, she, 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 she drowned in a bathtub. No, yeah, no, no, no. They, but like, by and large, but, but it's, it's sort of an interesting thing that you brush up against is um, while we were fictionalizing the sort of, you know, um, personal lives of the characters, um, we felt that we needed to, or we wanted to, you know, adhere to the basic scaffolding of the history as it presented itself, right? There was never, it was never gonna be a show where like, um, you know, Germany beat us to the bomb and, and dropped it on Manhattan or, you know, that, um, and so the science is all accurate and, uh, I mean, yeah, were the equations on the uh, oh, yeah. bulletin board? Or God, the, God the bless, board? yeah, David Salzberg and Glenn McDuff. We had incredible, because here's the deal, like, we are absolute idiots, the writers of this show. We were really, like, lovely idiots, but, like, there was, like, not a, nobody got above, like, a B minus in a, in a science class. I, and got, I never you know. took physics. Yeah, I, so we had to, um, so, you know, it, it took a lot of uh, work and a whole lot of help from very patient friends. Yeah, and, you know, there's a thing in filmmaking called hot set, which is you don't move anything. You're, you're still shooting there. Those chalkboards were hot sets. Don't erase them, because if we don't bring back the consultants, we can't even write it, even if we have a picture of it. It doesn't seem right. Well, you know, what I was just remembering is that, so there's a, a scene in the third episode of the first season where, so Charlie, part of the sort of conceit of the show, it, it, um, two of the central characters in an ensemble full of, and by the way, this is the other thing about the show, um, leaving aside the fact that we had more story to tell that we were excited to tell, um, it was such a heartbreak not to get to write for these actors, and I'm sure, Tommy, to be able to direct these actors. An unbelievable, I mean, Some like. Some who are here right now. Maybe mm. perhaps in this very room. Um, but it was just the greatest gift to be able to write for these. And all, you know, Tommy um, would say, uh, when we were talking about casting, and the great Jeannie Baccarat, who, who, uh, who cast the show, who is a genius right and is here, put together this extraordinary cat, like cast with us. And, you know, Tommy would always talk about a cast being an orchestra, you want to make sure that everybody is sort of play, playing a different instrument, and they sort of, but that they produce music together. And that was really the case with this cast. I mean, extraordinary actors um, who gave us comedy and who were heartbreaking, all of it. Anyway, central to the show, um, there's a character played by John Benjamin Hickey, who um, who has been at Los Alamos for a while, and. When we meet him, clearly there's been a cost to him um, uh, of doing the work that he's doing. And then there is a, a young couple who arrives in Los Alamos who are sort of, um, you know, they're the, it's it's their freshman fall, and they arrive. And there's a little bit of a sense that um, that there's a kind of a before and after story. Um, you know, Charlie Isaacs is sort of doe-eyed, you know, optimistic. You know, like part of the thing that was so interesting about this, the history is, by and large. The architects of this monstrous weapon were these, you know, lefty, humanistic, many of them Jewish, um, like uh, generally anti. You know, they they were um, they were these uh, optimists. That many of them believed that science was going to be a sort of utopian force for good in the world. That and um, splitting of the atom was going to be this extraordinary thing. That's exactly right. And um, and they certainly didn't um, expect that they were going to apply their very particular idiosyncratic genius to constructing the most destructive weapon that humankind had ever imagined. Um, and they paid a price. It, you know, it's sort of like they went into this place, this black box, and this other thing came out on the other side. And there's an incredible documentary called The Day After Trinity by a filmmaker named John Else that I think was nominated for an Academy Award in maybe 1980 or 81. And you see watching it that these folks are just kind of shells of their former selves, that something had happened to them um, in that place. Anyway, sorry. Stop that's talking okay. about well, we, that because we, that's season three, four, and five, well, but we're uh, still in a mourning process. So. That, that was a really well, crazy we see that. Yeah. I mean, we see it in, in the two seasons that we have. Yeah. You see the evolution of them just 
falling apart. You see Charlie Isaacs come in as this young, sort of fresh-faced genius and his beautiful wife, and you just see him completely crumble. Well, I, I remember that in episode three, there was a scene where Charlie humiliates a bunch of his fellow scientists by solving all of their equations very quickly on these, uh, these chalkboards, these equations that they've been slaving over for like for weeks. And we felt, thought the scene was great. And I remember that we handed it in and Tommy was like, are you fucking kidding me? It was like these actual, so like now it's our job to figure out how to write the <laughs> equation so that Charlie could, you know, I remember you were saying like, it's like the action line that says Atlanta burns. And then it's like, okay, well, how are we gonna figure out how to burn Atlanta, you know? But anyway, you guys always figured it out. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanna get back to the secrets thing because, you know, we, we do see the evolution of Charlie and all of them, you know, turn into these completely different people and angry and bitter and broken and heartbroken and poor Fritz, you know, and just, and I mean, it, it just, um, it, it's the secret, it seems to me, it's the secret keeping that really ate away at them, whether it was, you know, about having an affair or about the bomb. And the fact that, which, Tommy, you brought up in the other panel that you talked about this, you know, that, that the Los Alamos was a prison in and of itself. They couldn't leave. So they, they were invisible. They didn't exist as far as the rest of the country was concerned. They had all this knowledge in their head that they couldn't do anything with, you know, not even tell their family or, or anybody. And then they couldn't even leave the place. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, Leela. Yeah, I, well, I, just to come back to the topic of the women who are there, one of the things that was always so interesting to me in, in the research was that many of, as, as Sam was just saying, many of these scientists were, um, you know, lefty intellectuals, and many of them were married to women who were also extremely well-educated PhDs like Liza Winter. And um, I, I hadn't realized that this period leading up to, you know, uh, the leading up to World War II was a period of incredible um, progress towards equality between the sexes, at least among a certain sort of educated echelon of, of um, uh, American married couples, that women had made all of these tremendous gains. And suddenly, these married couples find themselves in Los Alamos, and the women are forced back into a role where they have no intellectual life, they have no professional life, their marriages look like marriages from an earlier era. They felt imprisoned. And that fracture, um, I think sort of presaged where um, American marriages went in the next couple of decades after uh, after the bomb. Um, so it was sort of you know one step forward, two steps back, and we you definitely see that in the show with both the Winters and uh, and Abby and Charlie. Yeah, well, I mean that definitely did happen because post World War II. All the women who had had war jobs, you know, my mother being one of them, all now were told, no, 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 go back home because we have to make room for the men to have jobs now that they're coming back from the war. And they were forced back into the home. And, and like you said, it was one step forward, two steps back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to me, that, that was always sort of connected to something that I found so fascinating, um, which was that Los Alamos was also it was basically the first modern planned community in the United States. And it became a template for Levittown when Levittown was built, in a way. And so when you start to um, process the idea that uh, the suburbs, as we understand them culturally, and I, by the way, I, like I give me any literature of the suburb, like I, I love that, you know, from like Cheever and Updike to, you know, Blue Velvet, like that sort of David Lynch sort of picket fences and, you know, but the insect creeping in the grass and it just a sense that there's a worm in the apple or something, you know, what is the, what's the dark secret behind picket fences? The idea that the suburbs 
and nuclear apocalypse were twins that were born in the same womb is a really fascinating idea because it it's, starts to suggest a reading of um, the kind of period of conservatism in the 1950s as a kind of way that the culture metabolized a topic that was too dangerous to talk about. You know, that the ultimate sort of secret behind the picket fence is that um, we now um, hold this power and that, you know, it could all cease to exist tomorrow. And how do you continue to live, you know, in that context? And um, I, so that, that was, I remember, it was so shocking to me to learn how progressive so many of the relationships and the marriages were, at least before, before Los Alamos, a lot of that changed. Yeah, I want to stick with the prison metaphor for a minute because, um, uh, I mean, I sort of, uh, uh, yeah, the women were in prison, everybody there was imprisoned by all of this, by their secrets. Um, do you think that's also a metaphor for war in general, that we've sort of painted ourselves into a corner? I mean, they painted themselves into a corner in terms of the bomb and these scientists found themselves in this corner. And what was so interesting to me about the storytelling too was you really saw their waffling one way or the other and to the point where they get to, you know, Winters and um, one of the other ones, the, oh, the, the guy who's the spy. Um, uh, Meeks. Meeks, thank you. Uh, you know, they both are convinced that deterrence is the only thing, the only way that it's going to solve. So we have to have the bomb so that we won't, so we'll scare everybody and then nobody, we won't have war anymore. You know, and they, they sort of thought that was going to be the answer. And I, I sort of think, is that, were they sort of trying to talk themselves into that, that because they had to make the bomb or did they really believe that? And of course, that's a conversation that's very relevant today. Yeah, Leela. Well, I was just going to say what it makes me think of is, you know, it wasn't too many years after the bomb was dropped that uh, Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex, right? And we're still living in that prison today. Um, and I think that that really was, you know, that was also created at Los Alamos in a way. Um, uh, we're still sort of yoked to that uh, lens through uh, which we view society and our, our sort of geopolitical priorities. Which are all very I mean, male-dominated. Uh, I remember we watched, we all watched Fog of War, this incredible documentary, uh, Errol Moore's documentary. And there's the lessons of the Fog of War in it. And one of them, which I think was the second season of, for me at least, a lot was, I don't know exactly the phrasing of it, but how much good needs to, I mean, how much evil needs to be done in the name of good. And I think that's what you're sort of talking about. Do you even know how much evil you are doing? Because you're rationalizing so much because you believe the good is so strong. So then you go into this slippery, slippery slope, which is n not necessarily a secret. It's self-deception. It's just, well, you know. Uh, yeah, isn't it? I think Meeks even says that. And we all are guilty that. of that all the time in our lives, do you know? And then if you take that on a scale of this matters to the idea that this could actually destroy the planet as we know it is a whole different thing than did I mention that there is a weird guy outside and that will scare my wife so maybe I'll just not mention it right now because that's better because I don't want her scared right now but then that's a simple one but it's the same thing it's the same exact thing yeah I mean Meeks doesn't Meeks say that exact like you know I'll, I have to do these bad things in order to so for the greater good, kind of, I mean, they're, they're all talking themselves into that. And, and um, Well, Meeks was doing what he was doing for the greater good. Yeah. I mean, Sam can explain that, but I mean, what he was perceiving, what he was doing was actually saving us all, even though he was a spy. Yeah, no, no, that's right. I mean, I think that there, I think that... Spoiler um, alert, by the way. I, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't, it's, I guess it's been long enough that we could spoil our own show. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I, th I, I, I think you're right. I think that there are a lot of um, ways in which the characters in the story felt like they were trapped. And there's a, um, 
a physicist named Freeman Dyson who has this quote that, that I think is in Day After Trinity that's really extraordinary about um, the, uh, the tra it's essentially about the trap of the science that um, for these minds, it became impossible not to solve the problem at some point. And particularly when, I mean, think about it, these are folks who otherwise would have lived out their careers, you know, in, you know, dusty lecture halls, you know, and they were geniuses on a scale where like only a handful of other geniuses were capable of recognizing their genius, but suddenly they're given the keys to a world war and that, you know, that never again will they have the burden, but also the kind of gift of being at the center of the universe that they got in that moment and the sort of idea that you can write an equation on a blackboard that will enable you to lift a million tons of rock into the air and what it is to feel that godlike power. It just, you know, as the, the, the scientists would say, the phrase they would use is they would say that it was, um, it was too sweet. The science was just too sweet and they became trapped by it at some point. And so the sort of human context of it, um, you know, what you always talk about, you know, what it is to depict war on TV. An interesting thing for us is, I think with the exception of one little flashback scene in the first season, which was very tricky to figure out on our budget and schedule, but um, you know, it was, a, it was largely a bloodless war and the war was an abstraction. And that was true of the experience of all those scientists who were there, um, which is that like, you know, in, in a way they're, they're sort of akin to like drone pilots, which is that like they would clock out and go home and sit at a, you know, form like a table. Um, and that was its own kind of trap too, I think. Yeah, it sanitizes war. Um, but, you know, what was great about, there's so many things great about Manhattan, but, you know, we all know what happened. I mean, we know that they, the bomb was dropped and it, twice, and it killed hundreds and thousands of people. Um, so we knew what the ending was. And what I found myself doing um, was, you know, you're kind of rooting for them to yes. succeed. You that know, was a trick of the show from yeah, the beginning. Yeah, they're competing in these two different teams of who's going to, you know, who's... Uh, it was the Bad News Bears, right? I mean, there was yeah. a counterfactual, which we found so fascinating, which was that initially all of the chips of the entire uh, uh, project were put on um, the wrong horse. That's a really mixed metaphor. Uh, you know... <laughs> So, Tommy knows that I I uh, I, 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 don't I don't play craps. I don't play craps or the craps table. But, but yeah. he just put both of them together. Thank you, thank you. Um, there were a lot of late nights at Buffalo Thunder <laughs> Casino uh, after we would wrap. Um, but uh, and Tommy never lost. But um, but uh, but so they bet on they bet they bet on the wrong bomb. And uh, and in the end, the bomb that won was this sort of scrappy B team of misfits um, who had the faith of no one in the leadership of the project. So that was such an interesting premise to us dramatically, but, but I think the underlying thing that we were excited about was that, you know, we're wired as human beings to love an underdog story. And so um, the audience can't help but become emotionally invested in the horse race and want to see one group succeed and David Harbour humiliated. David Harbour, another great actor we got to write for, unbelievable. Um, you know, uh, and of course, that was part of the hope as well, that the audience would have the experience that the characters had at some level of losing a grasp on what the moral context of the story was so that when ultimately that final frame of what became our series finale accidentally hits us pain, very painfully. It's a reminder of um, how much we've become complicit in a kind of headlong rush to war and bloodshed without even realizing it. Yeah, I mean, do either of you have something you want to say about that? Because I feel like I was so torn watching, like I wanted you know, I wanted Frank Winter's team to win, but then what does that mean? That means they're going to bomb hundreds well, of thousands this, like, of people and kill them. So, no, I don't want them to win, but I know, you know, it's... it's very we aired on this weirdo little network, and not a lot of people found our show, I will say. But one thing that was very interesting was that there was kind of a Rorschach test. There were, um, there were a lot of really raw-raj 
jingoistic viewers um, on the far right who thought that it was um, really refreshing that this patriotic story about you know the greatest generation was was on the air, um, and then um, which you know. Um, I, to a certain extent, I, I loved, I felt like it was interesting that um, viewers could sort of have their own experience. I obviously had my own point of view about the material um, that was different, but obviously there are, you know, there are a lot of real, um, there were a lot of anti-war lefties who um, felt about the show um, more like I think we felt about the show. But I also think your experience was a testament to these writers, which was, this was not a show about a bomb. Was not a show about the end of World War II. This was a group of people. Uh, and so if you just take two teams, uh, they're both arrogant pricks, the two guys. I mean, even Frank Winter. But Frank Winter was schlumpy, and it was like he has a, you know, a ragtag team, and it was like, and then this other guy was just full of arrogance and, you know, so clearly this sort of patriarchal, you know, figure that you couldn't help but root for that. And then you also knew their, you know, the Winter's relationship and what that was and Helen's relationship in it, you know, Katya's. And you were just rooting for those people. And you forgot, you should forget about what was the ultimate goal that they have because these are just people that you could relate to. And that was what they were writing. And it was extraordinary to sort of work on for that part. Well, and also I think that we, we really tried to put those questions on the page in the mouths of those characters so right. that we understood that the, the characters who we were rooting for were the characters who were anticipating the moral you know, equation <laughs> in front of them, um, whereas the characters we were rooting against, for the most part, were sort of walling themselves off from, from the ethical compromises that they were making. And that's why, you know, again, spoiler alert, that even in the finale in that last image, that last image is not just an image of a bomb, it's the image of a character. And the character represents all the other stuff that's gonna happen uh, to all of us. But we're caring about Fritz at that moment, you know, even though there's such a bigger thing that the show is about. Uh, but they're right in front of there is this betrayed young man yeah, wow. Um, all right, I have a couple others. And shouldn't There's... it still be on TV? Yes! Yeah. Oh my God, you know what? <laughs> Guys, can I tell you the real tragedy? The real tragedy about all this was like, we, <laughs> from the beginning, when you go and you pitch a TV show, often um, you're expected to sit down and say what's going to happen in the finale of season seven, which is absolute Bullshit. I mean, it's just nonsense. It's not. And by the way, and as well, it should be. You know, like there's a, like I think often there's a discussion um, culturally around TV about whether or not the writers are making it up as they go along. And I understand that we've been burned at times. You know, there's certain kinds of shows that seem to promise a kind of mathematical resolution to an equation or a revelation or you know, but um, but by and large, when it works best, it's because. Um, even if there's a best laid plan, the writers get together in a room and there's a kind of Darwinian process that's messy and people sometimes cry and yell at each other and make up and what, but everybody feels personally invested in you and you sort of discover things together. Um, and, the, and by the way, the actors teach you who the characters are. And that's, the, that's actually in some ways the most exciting part of doing it, you know, is that they teach you and you learn. Um, but anyway, we, we did have a plan and it was actually a pretty great plan. We sort of knew what it wanted to be. And the, the thing that is um, a heartbreak for us is that uh, the World War II, people, people used to ask at times, like, well, how is there more of a show because the war ends and they drop the bomb? Like, the World War II stuff was always the least interesting material to us in a way. We need to know what happens to Fritz. What? I mean, he <laughs> swallowed plutonium, what? you know? <laughs> well, I, I have a spoiler for you. Fritz, Fritz. <laughs> he dies. Fritz, 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 Fritz. But, um, but, it, it, uh, but to, to us, really, it was sort of like a before and after story. In fact, at one point, I remember Tommy, like, half-jokingly, but not entirely, had this pitch that, like, maybe we do the first, because we were going to have a six-season show that was going to be bisected by the dropping of the, of the bombs at the end of World right. War II. And it was sort of a, story, a before and after story about the extent to which America rebuilt itself in the image of this weapon and how that 
The knowledge of what the weapon was once Los Alamos went from being like the best kept secret on the planet to the most famous city in the world. And these guys are on the cover of Time Magazine and they're being championed as heroes and made poster boys and a few girls for um, this monstrous thing. Um, you know, that, that was where it got interesting, where you sort of lose the clarity of um, a righteous race against Hitler and the Nazis, you know, who has a problem with that, and where it becomes instead a much foggier kind of and morally ambiguous question of a Cold War um, and an, an arms race, that sort of thing. Um, anyway, it, it felt like, oh, so Tommy's pitch at some point was, right, that we do the first three seasons in black and white, and, right. it's, and, and it's like the Wizard of Oz, and then we're, you know, which I loved. Um, but, uh, but it sort of felt a little like we... I mean, we love, I love those seasons so much, but it's like we ate our vegetables and it was time to finally like get to like have our dessert. And, and I had a picture in my it. office of Hiroshima afterwards. And then, you know, Sam and the writers uncovered this story that many of the scientists actually were sent to Hiroshima. The people who created the bomb were then sent there to basically say there's no problem with radiation. You're, everything's going to be okay. So to imagine one of our scientists walking through that rubble that they are now responsible for was always like, okay, that's how we're coming into yeah. season three. It was going to be Eliza. And by the way, yeah, to not, exactly only, not, right. not, not, not only to, to sort of this patriotic mission to prove to the world that radiation sickness is a myth, you know, it's a fiction perpetrated by the Japanese to get better terms for, uh, you know, uh, the end of the war, but, um, but also they're, Friends are dying of cancer back home simultaneously. And so, I mean, that, that was a really fascinating aspect of it. It's very tough to do an anti-bomb show about the end of World War II because, <laughs> the, and, and somebody says it in the show, you know, if I don't drop the bomb and 100,000 more young men or women die, how do I tell those parents, I had the bomb, I could have stopped the war, but I didn't do it. So that moral dilemma, but afterwards, and you see what happened to Hiroshima and you understand that is a much easier way to do a show about the really destructive nature of what this bomb did and what the world will be. And not to mention Tinian and Island, and those, they all would have been wearing bathing suits. It would have been great. It would have been great. Frank Winter in a bathing suit. <laughs> he looks pretty good in the private uniform, I have to say, when he cleaned up. So did it, talking about the bomb, I mean, did it, did you, I presume you don't think a, a atomic bomb is a good thing, but I mean, did it change your attitude? Did you, did you, did it change your attitudes about war, about this kind of destruction? What's the predicament we're in now? With um, and, and actually, one of the characters says something about. Oh, I think it's Akeley in the first season. He says uh, something like, "Imagine if Stalin or the Shah of Iran gets the bomb." And that just gave me goosebumps because, you know, Russia does have it and Iran is on the verge of getting it. So, I mean, did you, did it make you more scared? Did it make you more concerned about now? How do you feel about the possibility that, you know, we're, we're facing it with Ukraine now and, and um, the possibility well, of it being used again? T Tommy always said while we were making it, and it was a really helpful thing. And part of it was to say, yes, the show is set in 1943, but it's not a period drama. It's, it's, it's a contemporary, we really always saw it as a contemporary story, but Tommy would say, um, it's a story that doesn't have an end yet, which is a really chilling thought. And I think it's right. I think it's right. Um, I, I, I found that working on the show made me feel um, much more worried about the state of the world than I did before I started working on it. But I will also say one other thing, which is that for me in writing it, and I think for basically all the writers who worked on it, um, I also didn't necessarily arrive at a place where I had one clear thought about the subject or the bomb by the end. And maybe part of it is that like in trying to play fair with the characters. We had to sort of live with all of them and live with a whole variety of points of view, but we felt like we wanted to dramatize a lot of points of view. And it, it felt like the reason why the show was such a, one reason why it was such a joy to write was that it's a really, really complicated subject. You know, there are a lot of room, there's a lot of room for mutually contradictory arguments that are really good arguments. And, um, and that helped it you know, it didn't feel like there was any straw man in that story. It felt like the more you um, look at it, the more 
complicated it is to, f to have a pat point of view about it? I think that's the why it was scarier, because the genie was out of the bottle. It's Pandora's, but it's the opening of the second, I guess, the first season, second season premiere or whatever, the plutonium coming. You're not going to get it back in the ketchup bottle. So therefore, how do we evolve as civilized people who never use this thing? And that's what was so frightening. And, and the other thing of never romanticizing this, it was very, you know, in that final episode where you're actually building the gadget, it's a stormy night, and, you know, and it's... Um, but we actually ended up, it wasn't black and white, but we did shoot that on 16 millimeter film. We shot that, all that part of the episode, everything that was at Trinity. Strangely, I mean, you know, I, not gonna mean a whole lot to a whole lot of people, but you know, it's, you're, you're using, you know, high definition and you're using a whole different way of shooting. And then, and part of it was just to, just to ground it with reality and nothing about this is romantic. Yes, it's a thriller and it's frightening and it's scary and the guy up there and what's gonna happen. And we sort of already know what's gonna happen, but it's still scary. But it was about, this is a really frightening, frightening thing. Uh, and just the image of it. I mean, we all took pictures. It was like, the whole thing was just when they, you know, cause it was exactly a replica of the gadget. It was exactly it, which is somewhere now, right? It's some yeah, it's, it's in, a museum. It's or? in a museum somewhere. It's in a yeah. museum. and it was beautiful. It was this incredible piece of yeah, work. Yeah, it was unbelievable. But it was also kind of jerry wig. I mean, yes. it was not. Oh, like, yeah, it doesn't it, look it, like it a nice of, smooth. Somebody thing. built this in their garage, a big huge thing in their garage. But when you looked at it, you thought, oh my god, this could throw us off our axis. <laughs> This could, you know, the well, did you have to, just back to directing for a second, did you have to manufacture that storm? Did we have, oh yeah. <laughs> They're rain machines. They're big, big <laughs> rain machines. You sort of can't, even though we did use weather for the show a lot, but rain is a hardly an unpredictable thing because if it stops in the middle of a scene, then you're, but we had massive rain towers and uh, we put our actors through a lot because they were, it was also a, had to be shot all at night. And so we both, we needed a, the sun to come up. So we would use both the sunset to start the day at the end of the scene and the sunrise to start the end of the scene. They were supposed to be the same thing because people aren't going to know, wait, is that a sunrise or a sunset? It looks similar though. So, uh, but uh, they were very wet and cold. I have a couple other questions I want to get to. One is um, I want to talk more about the women because there were, are, I mean, they're really strong women in the show. You know, Liza's incredible, and um, is it Helen? It's She's Helen. Here. Oh my God, really? Right oh my God. Woo! Right on. What an amazing character. And, um, you know, Kitty, I mean, all of them really were uh, quite strong, and, and of course, um, Abby. You know, you really see Abby transform. Um, I don't know if there's something you want to say about the storytelling piece of that, or <laughs> what's that? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I can't. I I certainly can't take the credit for that. I mean, Sam, as I said, I think it was it was really important to Sam. I think you could probably take a lot of credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it was really important. It was really important to Sam from the very beginning that 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 was fundamental to what the show was about, um, you know, was the, the trajectory of these women's lives um, uh, and treating their lives with just as much, you know, gravity and respect as the lives of these sort of history-making men. Um, but yeah, it was something, uh, you know, being in the writer's room, I, don't, I think we never felt like oh yeah, we have to service the women's stories, but really it's a show about the men. It was always completely integrated. And I think that often like our favorite stuff to write was for Helen and for Liza and for Abby. And I mean, that Kitty stuff I loved working on. Oh, that was amazing. And even yeah. the um, Meryl Streep's daughters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever her Mamie, character's Mamie name. Mamie Gummer. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, yeah. even her character, I mean, okay, she's a badass spy, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, they were strong women, and I, and I didn't feel like it was a show about dudes only at all, yeah. watching it. I think, I think we were so 
irritated very early on before the show premiered because there were sort of a couple of anticipatory, you know, uh, critiques that said, oh, oh, great, another show about the great men of history. And we were like, that's not what the show is. Just wait and watch yeah, it. Sort of like, fuck the great men of history was <laughs> yeah. sort of like our, like, thesis statement for a minute. Um, no, that's definitely true. Well, I also just think that we knew in terms of the kinds of stories that they weren't, they weren't necessarily the easiest stories to break, but the ones that felt best once we'd figured them out were not, it was not a show where it's sort of like, well, here's the work story and here's the home story or here's the relationship story and here's the science story. It was like, you know, it, it probably was a few episodes in, we broke a story that involved a kind of, um, a, a kind of battle intellectually between Charlie and Frank that eventually reveals um, uh, uh, something of the um, uh, about the sexuality and the interior life of uh, of Danny Stern's character, who's been a kind of a mentor to um, to Frank. And it, I think we sort of, in breaking that story, realized that we had sort of found almost accidentally what the show wanted most, which was to be a show where what appears to be a story about spycraft might actually become a story about, you know, um, the previously unplumbed depths in a relationship that haven't been explored before between two characters and vice versa, home stories that become a story that sort of has implications in terms of the project. And, you know, that, that was sort of like where it felt most alive, I think. And I think that, you know, one thing that we always really wanted to avoid was the kind of um, cliche in historical storytelling of treating the past as though um, it's preserved in amber and it's, you know, you're sort of seeing it through a sepia lens. Like, we really wanted the past to feel as alive as the present. And one of the ways of doing that is by um, by allowing characters who may have been marginalized in the history books to have full interior lives. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, like Katya's character and Liza's character both, I mean, those are, those are stories of women who are trying to, um, trying to carve out their own professional identities in very male-dominated spaces. And that, unfortunately, is a very contemporary story. It has not, you know, that has not left us. And so I think that, that those stories actually were part of what helped the show to feel more alive, <laughs> more, more real to a contemporary audience. Absolutely. And, you know, as I said, we work with a lot of nuclear scientists and, and there are women in the field and they still face those same challenges. And what would have been interesting, of course, I don't want to make you cry, in the future seasons, and I think we should get a petition like they did with Netflix and, you know, some of the other shows, but um, is to see, like, Helen's journey go forward, like, these guys were getting pretty emotional. She was having to hold it in because she's a woman. And if she started to get, you know, to cry or get hysterical or whatever, then she would be completely discounted. And this is the story I hear from the real nuclear people that I work with all the time. The women are like, I can't wear a flowery dress. I have to dress down. I can't, I can't cry. I can't. I'm talking about the end of the world. I'm talking about weapons that could destroy us all and I can't get emotional. You know, and I would have loved to have seen her journey. We had a lot planned for oh, Helen. Oh, <laughs> Helen, Helen, Helen. <laughs> um, I want to touch on one other thing in that, um, that you uh, showed how the development of this weapon affected the Native communities, the Native peoples. I mean, not only from taking over their land again, um, for Los Alamos, but also what we don't get to as much as I'm assuming we would have gotten to in future seasons, the fallout yeah. and the effect that to even today is still affecting the native peoples in that area. 
And it was great to see that represented. And I don't know if anybody wants to talk about that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an incredibly um, uh, deep part of the history that we were really interested in and wish that we'd been able to um, continue to tell that, that piece of the story. Um, but yeah, obviously all the sort of eminent domain stuff and, and the downwinder story is really an important story and that we would have loved to be able to spend more time on. And it also, you know, interestingly, a lot of the scientists became sort of fascinated with the native communities, I think in part because a lot of them were secular themselves and they were searching for some sense of, you know, something deeper or some sense of holiness and there's probably a little bit of a kind of fetishizing gaze that they you know um were guilty of but that but the complications and all that material i think uh, you know, we would have loved the other to thing that was so more. interesting is when shooting in new mexico almost everybody i mentioned this in the panel yesterday everybody who sort of worked on the show who were craftsmen or something who were from new mexico had some relationship to los alamos and then, because we would also shoot on indigenous land, and uh, those people would also then, they, their relationship, which was downwind, which was uh, what the after effects of Trinity were for so many people. Uh, and so that was just a story that we weren't allowed to tell yet, because it couldn't happen until they'd already dropped the bomb, and they had already done this. Well, there's other, I mean, not to, I mean, there's another piece of the history that, um, really only came to light in the last couple of decades. I think a lot of people popularly don't really know about, but um, beginning at Los Alamos and then elsewhere, there was a campaign of um, uh, exposing um, people unwittingly without their consent, obviously who would have consented to plutonium in order to be able to track um, what the uh, you know the uh, medical implications would be, including and uh, you know this is this is America, right? Lar largely African American. There's a harrowing story about a guy who was in a um, car accident near um, Los Alamos, I believe, and was treated you know for his injuries, and then had plutonium injected into his leg, and he was one of many dozens who were then followed over a, a period of years, and the heartbreak. I mean. Uh, the heartbreak, I'll, I'll say just one of the tragic ironies associated with it, is that the uh, scientists who were involved in that project, many of them were so haunted by the devastation that the bomb had wrought that um, they believed that what they were doing was they were going to um, pioneer a cure for cancer that was going to finally wipe the slates clean and morally justify the work that they'd done. So, I mean, you talk about a story in which the doubling down on a, a moral sunk cost and um, performing really um, some just harrowing acts in a sort of delusional state, believing that you're um, a force for good. Um, anyway, there was a lot there. A lot there. Oh my gosh, I, mean, I could talk about this show forever. Um, I want to get to um, kind of looking in the future. Um, when Meeks and Winter are in the tower, and they're just, you know, they're kind of talking. And um, Meek says, did you ever think what we could have done instead? Flying cars, send a man to the moon. You know, I mean, that is another line that really got to me because, of course, we don't have flying cars yet, but we keep, you know, we're going to soon. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I think that's the other thing. The dilemma of the scientist is what could we have done for good? Well, today, um, I see you. Um, <laughs> um, we've got, there's so much science in our lives. I mean, everything from electric cars to people trying to get to Mars, one person after another. Um, and AI is kind of this to me, AI sort of seems like the next nuclear bomb in a way, where there's so much science around it right now. There's so much going on. I mean, it, we, AI's already in our life. Everybody's got a Roomba, right? But I mean, it's, it's more and more and more. And I've, I've been working with a group of scientists around AI because they're very concerned 
that it's going to be taken down this road of weaponry. It already is. I mean, it already is. Um, where there's also another avenue for good. You know, AI is really helpful for people for people with disabilities and aging and in healthcare and in all kinds of things. And it's going to be more and more in our lives. So a Maybe that's a show, <laughs> but really, I mean, what do you think about, um, you know, kind of what's going on now? I mean, and, and we still have the nuclear threat. I mean, it's not gone away and it's been, they've been saber rattling about it lately. But what do you think about, you know, future weapons and what's going on now that we may not know about that the government is developing or testing or whatever? And, and what just, do you think? trust that they have our best interests at heart. Don't you guys? <laughs> I love you, Sam. You sweet, sweet man. We can tell you that there was a time when Tommy, I, we had a conversation at some point where we were like, we could never get him back again. But what if we made a show, contemporary show, because right. nobody's going to pay us to make another fucking period show. But what if it's a contemporary show, it was about the development of, you know, I, it could have been about AI, but it could, you know, any number of areas involving, um, dangerous technology and just like get our, get our old gang back together and can, they can play new roles and we'll do the, you know, I, I, will, I will tell you. Or go back where they're unearthing all of this radiation and plutonium now in Washington state and, you know, right. uh, and just bring that whole group back, but not. We just want to work with our friends and, again. Uh, <laughs> we just want to work with our friends. I will tell you this about the AI, which is just, I think a good ending note, which is I would just call you if you're going to do a show about this, I would call you uh -huh. so that you would be able to give us the key people who are really doing this. I know. Which I, is I wish your you would organization know you does, really. which is when you guys set this up, which is extraordinary because as filmmakers, your instinct is to want to get it right. You know, you want to tell the best story, but you need really a lot of help in order to do that, and you guys are the access for that. So thank you. Yeah. Oh man, what a way to end the, the talk, Leela. Well. Leela, what would you like to say about us? All I was going to say, yes, incredible organization. We're so grateful to you, Kate, for all of your support of Manhattan over the years. And it's been so fun to come back and talk about it. All I was going to say to your point is that I think every, um, you know, I've, I've written a fair amount about technology on screen. And, and, um, and it's something I think about a great deal. And I think every... Every story about technology is a story about humanity, about how we encode our biases and preferences and ideas into tools of technology. And I think that ultimately is what Manhattan was. You know, it was a, a story of the humanity and technology and, and what, what, you know, these very flawed individuals um, encoded into this weapon of war. So. That's right. That in some ways, the bomb was a story that we told ourselves about ourselves. Yeah. That's wow. a good way to end. Too. That's a great way to end. And I think I'm, I was supposed to ask for questions. So I don't know if, if people have to go, but uh, maybe we can take a couple of quick questions. Did you? Sure. Yeah. Well, I don't think there was, but I'm, I am really excited that you saw that. Uh, but, 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 but there was a, I mean, there were a lot of visions that were part of the show. I don't, I mean, I think the classic definition of noir is absolutely right for this show. Absolutely right for the show. Was it really, you know, I, I know the cinematographer and I were looking at other things uh, rather than sort of classic, incredible noir stuff. But we were using contrast, light, a whole lot of ways that were part of that. It just wasn't part of the discussion. But it makes sense if you'd been in the room, we would have gone, oh, that actually makes sense. Let's also look at this, this, and this. So I just want to say that. But I don't know if you guys were already thinking that before. Um, 
No, and the other thing is just, you know, um, no, it was just like, I mean, a joke about this, about just wanting to be, be able to work with our, our friends. Um, I, I, I'm gonna try not to get emotional saying this, but the greatest gift of making this show was my friendship with Tommy Shlomi. It, uh, it's one of the great gifts of my life, and um, and just so people people um, just so you understand how this stuff Could you goes. Guys leave for a while, listen, I... <laughs> you know. So they, they made the there's a movie about the Manhattan Project, right? Called Fat Man and Little Boy. Those are the two. Um, I'm not going to call Tommy a fat man, but they're, but but you know, there's the General Groves of the General, and then there was this uh, this little you know pencil necked scientist Oppenheimer, and and in, and you know I, I I'd written these scripts and lived with this thing for a long time, and then Tommy became my partner and um, was one of the extraordinary storytellers in this medium, as you guys all know. And if anybody ever would have had the right to Bigfoot the kid, it would have been this man on this stage. And, um, and it's, yeah, as I say, it was, never not an education and the greatest. So, so the one other thing, just as selfishly, because we don't get to talk about this show very much. We made it a long time ago. But I'm just so grateful to you, Tommy. Thank you, Sam. I just want to, I, I, I won't go right back at Sam, because then it'll look like I'm just complimenting for the same reason. Okay. Yeah, but the truth the, of it this is, is a hotel. We happened, can get you guys a room. What happened yesterday by doing that panel, and I know how much they wanted to be here, but they're also extraordinary parents and have an extraordinary two boys and this one boy who's like already he's on the sex pistols. I don't know what he's doing, but uh, uh, but it wasn't. It was Sam set set this world up for all of us that we all should have came. But it is that Jeannie's here and Katya's here. For I've done a lot of shows and I've created a lot of families, but I never created a family like this or was part. I didn't create this family. Was part of this family that stunningly is still together so that that this festival has this moment that we can talk about. I mean, it was the whole time while this was going on, getting to hear Sam again talk about this, getting to hear Leela again talk about this. Seeing these people is very emotional for all of us because this show was way more than just the 20 episodes, 20? 23. 23 episodes that we did. It was really this incredible group of people. And we had this, there was a motto at one point, you know, they built an atomic bomb, we can make a fucking television show. Uh, but we were actually making a family, and, and we were sort of in the desert ourselves, thrown in there, and that'll never go away, and that's because somebody came up with an idea a long time ago, and it evolved into this, and that's Sam. I think we gotta get the band to get back together and, and get this show going. Please, give it up for our panel. <laughs>